Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. So Adele Height, welcome to this next episode of uh, the Low Carb USA podcast. Thanks, Doug. I'm happy to be here. So that was quite amazing. When you started with this project with us, you were just Adele Height and, and you actually qualified with your PhD during this process, right? Yes. It took me a little longer to finish, but I was busy with a lot of other things. And this is, this is one of them, but um, it, was, it was very worth it to me. While I'm very, very proud of my dissertation, I don't think it's going to have the kind of immediate impact that um, these guidelines are having already. I got you in on the behest of uh, Gary Taubes to help mediate this feedback session we had last year at our San Diego event. And it was really the conversations we had around this when I very first reached out to you um, that made me sort of realize that this was something that, that we really needed to try and do. And you were really passionate about it beforehand. I think you must have been having discussions with Gary about it already, which is why he suggested that I get you involved in, in mediating this session. Um, and it seems like you've been wanting to do something like this for a long time. And I think I had some of the building blocks and the pieces that, that were needed to actually make this happen. But at the end of the day, I think people need to know that you were instrumental in this whole thing happening and you did an incredible amount of work um, in putting this all together and herding the cats, as you put it, um, while you were defending your uh, PhD dissertation as well at the same time. But maybe you can just talk about why you were so passionate about doing this and, um, and how excited I think I've, I've seen you be when it, that is actually being published now. Yeah, it, it is very exciting to me and um, very fulfilling. It is a dream come true. So this did begin oh, probably maybe four years ago, longer than that, maybe. Um, Gary Tobbs and I have been discussing, you know, what it is that we need to get over this hump of these little pockets of um, low carb practitioners doing their work. I mean, we, you've done a great job of connecting all of them through your conferences. Um, but we were looking for, for a way to bring people together as a community. Um, and there are all sorts of ideas um, floated. One of the ones that's floated and that hasn't happened yet is the idea of a professional association. Um, and, and I think that that's something that, um, you know, brings professionals with a common interest and, and common practicing intentions and goals and practices together. But it seemed like a step was missing in there somewhere. And what happened was I got called for jury duty. So this is, this is the origins of the whole clinical guidelines um, and, the, and the standard of care is I got called for jury duty in a malpractice suit. It, it looked at the beginning like it was going to be pretty cut and dried. It looked like a medical mistake was made and that the surgeon who made it was at fault. As the story unfolded, it became clear that the particular surgery that um, we, were, we were talking about in this lawsuit was one that only a few people in the country used, and they were essentially trained by the same method. And what we learned through learning about this surgery and learning about the process of how a surgeon would go about learning a new um, intervention is that there was a standard of care, so a standard way of going about doing this surgery that everybody who was trained on this surgery used. And when you're following a standard of care, you're not talking about guidelines because these surgeons weren't given, first you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. You know, there is a lot of literally feel to it. You feel something and you feel something else. And so they brought together other surgeons who were trained on this, and all of them said, 
we would have done the exact same thing in that situation. And when we, when the jury was dismissed to go and talk about, you know, our verdict, the judge gave us a lengthy <laughs> education in what a standard of care was. And he was very clear, standard of care is not written guidance. So it's not following guidelines or not following guidelines. Standard of care is not um, necessarily um, a standard way of doing things for the entire group of surgeons because not all surgeons are trained in this surgery. Standard of care is the way a clinical practitioner who has the same education, so being trained in this surgery, the same type of patient, so the same condition that um, would be presented, you know, as, as, a, as a purpose for undergoing the surgery, that, that's what creates a standard of care. When you have these similarities in training and you have these similarities in patient population, the way that everyone in that community goes about treating that, a patient is a standard of care. So a standard of care is practice-based. It's not language-based. However, as Gary and I talked about it, and then as you came into the conversation, one of the, one of the primary takeaways from my program is that language does things. And it doesn't just do things like when you tell someone, get out of here, um, and language makes that happen. Language does something. It helps us to create the world that we live in. Um, and, and this is, um, you know, obvious in, in any walk of life. If you use language that treats people with dignity, then you are creating a world where dignity and identity are important. So that language it makes that relationship more equal. And it seems like sort of a trite or simplistic sort of thing, but language does act that way. And so what Gary and I, and then when you joined the conversation, talked about is the ways in which creating a document where we work on common language and we work together on identifying common practices was a way of creating a standard of care within this community. So the guidelines themselves, which are an input from all qualified clinicians, so MDs and DOs who work with patients who um, it's appropriate to use these kinds of interventions with, who either use therapeutic carbohydrate reduction in their clinical practice or in their research. These are the people who came together to offer the information that then I just organized and collated and tried to deal with discrepancies when the language um, did make sense. Um, I would reach out to the people who made the comments and say, could you clarify this for me? Could you provide a, a reference for this? Things like that. But the, it was that act of coming together, that act of participating in the creation of these guidelines that I think is central to the standard of care. The guidelines themselves are super important. They give us something to look at, something that can be translated, something that we can sign on to as a way of saying, yes, these are practice guidelines that I adhere to. These are research standards that I use. Um, but more than anything else, they were a way of saying, we are a community. Therapeutic carbohydrate reduction is not a fad. It's not a... a you know, fly by night way of eating that's going to go up in the Google searches and then back down again. It is a therapeutic intervention that we use with the patients for whom it's appropriate. And we follow the clinical guidelines as a standard of care, which begins to bring us together in terms of education, in terms of recognizing which patient populations this is appropriate for. Um, and, and that's the whole idea of coming together and creating a community. And so what are the other pieces that we need? Well, you're working on some of them, which is the common education part. I'm working on some of them in, in my work with Diet Doctor. Common education so that we have this common educational background. Um, as we do um, these addendums where we identify specific patient populations for whom therapeutic carbohydrate reduction is appropriate, that's another way of 
creating a standard of care is that we say this intervention is appropriate for these people and here's why. And again, so we have a common education, we have a common practice base, and it brings us all together as a community to discuss and to um, challenge each other to use the highest level of evidence um, in, our, in our practice and in our research. And that's how we show the rest of the world that we mean business. And uh, that's something that we've recently added to the guidelines page on, on our site is an opportunity there for practitioners and clinicians to actually go in there and formally register their support for, for these guidelines. And they, once they do that, their name gets added to the list at the end of the document for those people that pledge the support for it. And that's obviously growing leaps and bounds now, which is, which is super exciting because now we have a, a documented uh, database, basically, of, of people that actually support it, which contributes down the road to this whole standard of care um, concept, which is about people with the same education in the same environment, basically having the same idea about what's, what's the right thing to do in a particular situation. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's really important um, because the, the statement of support makes it clear and we, and we should make it clear that these are not rules. <laughs> Our clinical guidelines are not a way of saying, um, you know, this is the way you do it and there's no other way. What we mean by consensus or support here is that not only do we agree on what we agree on, but we also agree on what we disagree on. And there are plenty of areas um, some people use net carbs, some people use total carbs, some people use um, higher levels of protein, some people use somewhat lower levels of protein, but you know, that we, that we do ag agree to disagree, That's, that protein ranges might be different. Um, and, and there's other things that we've agreed to disagree on, but consensus is pointing out those differences of opinion. It's not saying we all have to agree on everything, it's saying we agree on these things, and then we agree that we need more research, that we need more clinical experience, that we need more investigation in these other areas. What we don't want is people saying, oh, it's all settled. We've completely settled this issue as regard to net carbs versus total carbs when it's not settled and the community agrees that it's not settled. And what's uh, amazing to me was the very soon after we published it, I think it was even like the same day, I got approached by a couple of people and um, wanting to help us now get it published in Medscape and also suggesting that we have it translated into all the different languages that Medscape support, which is Portuguese, Spanish, uh, German and French. And I'm really excited about the fact that we've already published the German translation the Portuguese one is in the works probably in the next day or two, we're going to publish that. The Spanish one is, is close behind that. And the French translation is, is in the works as well. So, um, and we even getting the, the, the guys that invited us to Indonesia for that conference we had in Jakarta, they are converting it into their um, Indonesian language as well. So, but that, that's, that's pretty awesome. Goosebumps. Yes, it is. It's very awesome. And as I said at the beginning, like my dissertation, I'm really proud of that. I think it's, it's an excellent piece of work. But this work is going out there in the world and it's, and it's making real changes. It's going to allow the uh, Spanish speaking community to gather around it, the Portuguese speaking community, the German speaking community, the Indonesian speaking community, to all have something that they can point to, that they can argue over, that they can discuss, that's theirs, um, to begin to move this work forward. And I just, it really does. It gives me goosebumps. And I'll thank you from the bottom of my heart, honestly, for the effort that you put in uh, to do this. It was monumental. And I think it's, it's going to turn out to be something that really does help change the world. So I, I just need to say one quick thing, and I probably should say it a lot more often, but the person who makes this all possible is my wonderful, supportive husband, Greg Bauer, who goes to work 
and feeds me and makes me coffee while I work on these crazy projects, including the clinical guidelines. He's been so supportive. This is his work too. I guess that's all I want to say. This is his work too. Well, thank you, Greg. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Adele. So you'll notice that we haven't had any commercials at all during this podcast, and we, we intend to keep it like that if we possibly can. But at the same time, the, the work that we're doing and the efforts that we're going to to get the clinical guidelines done, uh, there's just so much to do. And in order to really, for this to be sustainable, um, we need your help. And so... Uh, what we're asking you to do is go and take a look at our at our Patreon account. It, it, there's actually quite a few options there. There's it, it provides you with options to actually go onto our site, and there's membership options there where you can um, get access to all our video content and and other other perks of being a member, um, or even just you know a, a dollar a month become become a patron. And you can find that in, in um, patreon.com slash lowcarbusa. I'll put it in the show notes and in the episode notes so that you can find it. And um, yeah, help, help us to, to change the world. Yeah, so I think a lot of people take a look at the, um, the conference registrations and I think they immediately assume that, you know, from a distance that these might be money-making endeavors that we're doing with these conferences. And you know, it's hard to admit and it's hard to tell people that we really aren't making any money from these. Um, there, All 11 of the events that we've done have not been a profitable endeavor. Um, we've literally had to dip into our credit, basically. It wasn't anything. It wasn't like we actually had a pocket to dip into and put money into. We, you know, we've had to take loans and, do, and um, get a lot of credit for these events. So um, any little bit that you can help every ticket that's sold every little bit of a um, dollar a month in a Patreon account will help us to fund our endeavors and fund our, the programs so that we continue to do some of these other things that are free content. Um, the project management that we're doing on the clinical guidelines will really go a long way. <laughs>